I'm back on the adventure of the Bible. And you can't go on an adventure of the Bible without rightly dividing the word of truth. So look at 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So if you're going to be approved unto God and not be ashamed, you're going to need to study and you're going to need to rightly divide the word of truth. And every great Bible teacher I know of always says this phrase, everything in the Bible is for me, but not everything is to me. There are some extremely plain divisions and rightly dividing. There's extremely plain divisions. Let me show you what I mean. Look at John 1, 17. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, and verse 17. It says this. It says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. There's your plain division. The law was given by Moses. So from Adam to Moses, if the law didn't show up until Moses... That's an extremely plain division there. From Adam to Moses is an extremely plain division. And then look at Luke 16.16. 16. Luke 16 and verse 16. It says, The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. So the law and the prophets were until John. There's an extremely plain division. You got from Adam to Moses. The law was given by Moses. And then the law and the prophets were until John, John the Baptist. So you've got the law all the way up until the earthly ministry of Jesus there. That's an extremely plain division. Then you got Jesus Christ's earthly ministry to the time of the New Testament. Look at Hebrews 9.15. Hebrews 9.15 says, And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgression that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Verse 16 for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. So the New Testament doesn't actually start until the Lord Jesus Christ dies on the cross. So everything before that was Old Testament. So look at these extremely plain divisions again. You got from the time of Adam, you know, back there, the first man, the time of Adam to Moses because the law was given by Moses, showing you something different was taking place because the law wasn't there until Moses. Adam to Moses. And then you got Moses to John in Luke 16, 16. And then you got from John and the earthly ministry of Jesus all the way up to Jesus' death on the cross, and then that brings in the New Testament. And then you got everybody, what everybody can see, an extremely plain division, of course, Old Testament, and you got a New Testament. Second Corinthians mentions Old Testament. And Second Corinthians 3.14 but their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. So anybody can see these extremely plain divisions, even people that don't believe in dispensations and whatnot. They can see that from Adam to Moses, the law hadn't been given yet. They can see that something 
different started taking place when John the Baptist and the Lord Jesus Christ showed up in his earthly ministry. So the law and the prophets were until John. And they can plainly read over there in Hebrews 9.16 where it says that a, a testament starts with the death of the testator. Showing you once again another division. So you can't talk about rightly dividing without also talking about dispensations. Now, people want to say that dispensations, that's not in the Bible and whatnot, but the word shows up four times in the Bible. I think that's significant. And let's look at how the word's used in 1 Corinthians 9.17. In 1 Corinthians 9.17 it says, For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. So a dispensation of the gospel. And then it says Ephesians 1.10. In Ephesians 1 and verse 10, it says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth. Then Ephesians 3, 2, it says, If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word. And then in Colossians 1, 25, Colossians 1, 25, says, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. So dispensation that word is a Bible term. Now, I'm not that smart, so I have to come up with ways to remember stuff and what they mean. And when I think of the word dispensation, I think of what I used to play with as a kid, a Pez dispenser. Those little toys with the, you, you, the, with the candy that shoots out. So in the Bible, there are dispensings of particular truths that are given out in different times. You know, you just it's God dispensing something, just like a dispenser. You see, if you rightly divide, you are careful to notice God's changes in direction and different truths that he dispenses out to different people. And this is all through the Bible. You're seeing him change how he operates, change how he does things. Now, God doesn't change, but what he does, does change. Because look at Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. You see that? At sundry times and in diverse manners, different manners, spaking time passing to the fathers by the prophets. You see, God doesn't always do the same thing with everybody throughout the Bible. And that's where rightly dividing comes in. That's where dispensations comes in. All this really is, is you're recognizing God doing things differently throughout the Bible. That way you rightly divide. You don't get confused. And you realize everything in the Bible is for you, but not everything is to you. For an example, you know Israel had to keep the Sabbath back there in Exodus. It shows up. But today, you're not required to keep the Sabbath. Same goes for animal sacrifices. Throughout the Old Testament, you've got animal sacrifices. Today, you aren't required to keep no sacrifices. You're not supposed to do a sacrifice. You're not even supposed to do that. And that, you're rejecting the ultimate sacrifice when you do that, you see. So while that was a good thing, God had respect to Abel's offering, remember? Remember? You come to the Lord with the offering a lamb, he's not going to have respect to your offering. He's already became the Lamb of God. You see, there's differences in how this thing is set up. 
And also, you want to pay close attention to words and phrases like the phrase, but now, or until, or in that day. These phrases will always lead you to rightly dividing. But it's God that does the dividing. You don't want to overly divide and you don't want to under divide. But let's look at some, some of these divisions. And some of these times that the Bible gives. And, you know, there's there are man-made titles for it, which... I like myself, but a lot of people is like, well, that's a man-made title. That's not in the Bible. So let's go through and we'll just see the titles that God gives it. And look at Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28, 13 through 15. Now this is when, back before Adam and Eve, when it all starts. And Ezekiel 28, 13 it said, this is talking about Lucifer. It says, thou hast been, notice that phrase, showing you. This took place, but it's not anymore. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. There was a time when he was there, but he's not there anymore. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, the topaz, and the diamond, and the barrel, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. He was... But he's not anymore. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect. He was perfect. You see that? Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. So, I just simply have a title for this time that I remember it by. When Lucifer was perfect, because that's what it says, thou wast perfect. So this had to be before Adam and Eve, because when the devil shows up to Adam and Eve, he's already the serpent, and here in Ezekiel 28, 13 through 15, he is perfect. He's a beautiful creature. When he showed up to them, he's already the serpent. He's already sin personified. So there is an unknown period of time where Lucifer was perfect with a throne and all the heavenly hosts were perfect and praising God and there is no sin yet. You see, this is a, a time that's not like any other time after it so far. You know, this is a time when there is no sin at all. That's a time much different than now. This is a time when man hasn't even showed up yet. It's just the Lord and his heavenly host that he's created. And Lucifer is the one that's the king right now under the Lord, of course. Back here when Lucifer was perfect. So for this time period, this would take place between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. Now, I've talked about this before, and I think most of you that listen to me, you, you already know about this, so I won't get much into it, but I believe that this time period is Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and right there, that's a complete, perfect creation. And then you've got a gap and then in verse 2, it picks up and says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So the, God created the heaven and the earth. Something happened, which we have went into it many times before, where Lucifer, iniquity was found in him. He loses his throne. The Lord floods the thing out as it talks about in Second Peter, and makes the earth without form and void 
and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And if you study those words without form and void and darkness throughout the Bible, it will lead you to that conclusion that a catastrophe has taken place. So that's the first one. When Lucifer was perfect. So we're just going through the Bible and we're looking at changes. We're looking at differences. We're looking at divisions that God himself has put in there and shows you these plain divisions. We gave you extremely plain divisions that everybody could see. Now we're showing you some that are still really plain, just not as plain. So the first one is when Lucifer was perfect. That's completely different than now. He's completely evil now. Now the second one. And I've just got this title for this one from Genesis 5.1. Where it says, this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. So this second one. I got the title, In the Day That God Created Man, showing you plainly that there was a day when man was not here. Man's not always been here. God made man. God didn't make uh, something and that turn into a man. God made the man out of the dust of the ground. So that's what I titled this one. The first one was, when Lucifer was perfect. The second one, in the day that God created man. Look at Genesis 1, 27 through 29. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So Lucifer, who was perfect, he no longer has dominion. Now it's given to Adam. He's crowned, crowned with glory and honor. And this is a time when man hasn't sinned. That's a completely different thing going on. You went, If you went back in time... To in the day that God created man, you got a completely different thing going on. No sin into the world. The devil brings sin into the universe, but Adam brings sin into the world. You see, in a world that ha doesn't have sin in it yet, is a completely different scenario, situation. God's dealing with man at a completely different way. And let's look at some very different things that's taken place over here in the day that God created man. For one thing, at this time, man is a vegetarian. It says in Genesis 129, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. And when the Bible says meat, it just doesn't just mean like steak and stuff like that. It's what you eat. Meat is what you eat in the Bible. So he's given them every tree and every herb bearing seed for food. So they're vegetarians right here. And you know, people that don't rightly divide, they may come back here and say, well, see... We don't need to be eating meat. Look at what they're eating back here in the Garden of Eden. And they'll start this big new doctrine where they're telling everybody that they're sinning if they're eating meat. That's not rightly dividing. That's going back to a time way, way, way back. That's going back and using Adam and Eve and the time period that they're in, and the instructions that they've got, and the dispensation that they're in, and applying that to yourself. 
But look at 1 Timothy 4, 3 through 4. 1 Timothy 4, 3 through 4. It says, Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. But look at the verse before that. Look at 1 Timothy 4, 1. It says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. So you can eat anything. You can eat any animal as long as you can receive it with thanksgiving. You know, there's not... I don't want to eat every animal. But I can't look at this guy that's eating this certain kind of animal that I don't want to eat and say that he's doing wrong because if he can eat that and receive it with thanksgiving, he's good. But now you got people, like I said, they'll go back to like Genesis 129 and say, well, see, they're vegetarians here so that they start teaching everybody to be a vegetarian. That is wrongly dividing, and this calls it a doctrine of a devil to tell somebody to abstain from meats. Now, for Adam and Eve, that was not so. If they were saying, you know, we don't eat animals, that's not a doctrine of a devil. If they're saying we just eat the er every herb-bearing seed and of the tree, that's not that's not a doctrine of a devil because the truth that they had is different than the truth that we had. God dispensed truth to them. And he dispenses truth to us. What he gave to us is different than what he gave them. So, there are vegetarians back there. Animals also are vegetarians at this time. Look at Genesis 1.30. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, where therein is the breath, where therein, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. So, they're vegetarians as well. Now, that's completely different than today. So, what you're looking at in the day that God created man, it's a completely different time. A completely different truth is dispensed. A completely different scenario all the way around. Now another thing, you think about this. They're told to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Over in Genesis 1, 28, it says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. But it's wrong to preach this today in order to tell people that they can have no birth control. You know, telling them that they need to just have as many kids as they can because we need to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. You've got people that teach that. And they say any form of birth control would be wrong because of Genesis 128 where it says be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Now if you want to go and have 15 kids. Go have 15 kids. If that's what you want to do. But you can't take Genesis 128. And put that on your whole congregation today. Like I've heard a lot of pastors do. And they're just wanting uh, people to just keep pumping out kids. That way their church just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And you know a lot of cults do that too. Where maybe they can't get that many converts so they just have their people keep pumping out kid after kid after kid and then uh then they'll take this then they'll take multiple wives and pump out kid after kid after kid be fruitful and multiply you know making their kingdom bigger and bigger but see adam and eve are told to be fruitful and multiply because i mean they're the only ones and if they didn't be fruitful and multiply then there wouldn't be nobody else 
And then at, when Noah gets off the ark, he's told to be fruitful and multiply because him and his three sons and their three wives and his wife is the only ones left. And if they didn't be fruitful and multiply, then they would just go extinct, you see. So I'm not going to go back there to Genesis 128 and tell people, well, no, you can't have birth control because uh, it says be fruitful and multiply. No, I'm not going to do that. That would be wrongly dividing. You know, they're, it's a completely different time they're in, a completely different scenario going on. And you, you think about it, that's, that's between you and God how many kids you have. And some people shouldn't even have any more kids with this what it, with this certain situation they're in. They shouldn't even have any more kids or maybe not even have any kids at all in the situation that they're in. That's between them and God. And then in Genesis 2.25, look at something else. In Genesis 2.25, I'm going to show you something else very different that was going on in the day that God created man. It says, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now that's very different. And you know, I've, I've heard of the naked church. That is a real thing. I, I think it was in Kentucky or Virginia or somewhere. But these, these people, they actually, they go to church naked. And I would hate to see an altar call there. That would be nasty. But the, the naked church is what he called it. And you know what he used was Genesis 2.25. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So he says, we go back to Adam and Eve. They're vegetarians. They're both naked. They're not ashamed. And he takes that and then he just overrides the rest of the Bible with that. You see, you open up the Bible and everything in the Bible is for me, but it ain't to me. I can go back here and get all this truth from in the day that God created man, but I'm not going to take the instructions that they have and put them on myself. That would be wrongly dividing and all of the bad teaching that you have today, almost all of it comes from wrongly dividing. That's why they. That's why the cults always have a Bible verse to back up what they teach, because they're taking a teaching from another place in time. They're taking a truth that was for somebody else and putting it on themselves today, and it makes things contradict. You see? So, that's a big difference. Today, you're considered devil-possessed for wearing no clothes. Just like in, in Luke 8, 27 and 35, you know, you have the maniac of Gadara, and he wore no clothes, the Bible says. It says in Luke eight twenty seven, and when he went forth to land, there met him out of there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils a long time and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house but in the tombs. But then what happened after he got the devils out of him? In verse thirty five, it says, then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. So walking around with no clothes in front of people that you're not married to is could be a sign of devil possession or devil influence, but it wasn't so for Adam. They were both naked the man and his wife and were not ashamed it was okay today that's not okay you can't do that it's against the law to do that it's against the bible to do that you know for for the rest of the bible i don't see that you're it's ever okay to be naked you know even in the 
Even in the millennium and eternity, you're wearing fine linen. And you don't want to be found naked. 2 Corinthians 5.3 So, completely different scenario with Adam and Eve in the day that God created man. Now another thing, in Genesis 2.15, Adam worked without sweating. He Before the fall, he was working without having to sweat. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And he's working, but it's not hard. It's not really hard work. He's enjoying it. And the, the world can only attempt to counterfeit this with easier jobs and air conditioning. But then even, even if you've got an easy job and air conditioning, you'll have to get the sweat out some way. So what do they do after work? They go to the gym. Now, if you got a job like Adam has after the fall, then you don't have to go to the gym. You just sweat it all day long for about eight, nine, ten hours. So you got all that sweat and junk out of you. Completely different thing going on. Adam working without sweating. Adam working and enjoying it in Genesis 2.15. And what you have here in the day that God created man People commonly refer to this as the dispensation of innocence. Dispensation of innocence. And people say, well, that's a man-made title. Well, calling it dispensation of innocence is a man-made thing, but it, it's, it's biblical. They are innocent, and it is a dispensation. God's dispensing truth to them. They're going by that truth up until... They eat off the tree, and they're innocent up until they eat off the tree. So it makes sense to call it the dispensation of innocence. Now, I, ca I called it in the day that God created man and gave it that title that I could find in the Bible to show you the plain division. But the dispensation of innocence ends with the devil taking away their innocence. In 2 Corinthians 11.3, it says, But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. You see, they were in a very simple times. Very simple. Had one command, down eat off of the tree. God told Adam, don't eat off the tree. Adam would have told Eve, God says, don't eat off of that tree. That was their only command. It was very simple times. But the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. And just like he wants to do today, he wants to take away the simplicity that's in Christ. To be saved, you're told something very simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Acts 16.31 The devil would like to corrupt that simplicity that's in Christ. After you get saved, you're kept saved by the power of God. You don't keep yourself saved, but the devil would love to twist that simple truth into you're keeping yourself saved, and you've got to fulfill this list of standards to be saved. But see, you know, the devil was perfect. There was a time when Lucifer was perfect, and he was in Eden, the garden of God, over in Ezekiel 28. And then in the day that God created man, he's looking down, and he sees Adam and Eve, and Adam's got this crown of glory and honor. Automatically, that serpent is envious, and he's ready to kill. Adam and Eve. He sees how innocent they are. He sees how simple they are. How simple they have it. And what does the devil want to do? He wants to take away their innocence. So that he can end this dispensation of innocence. And he wants to take away the simplicity that they have. 
And you know, the Bible says in Romans 16, 19, we need to be simple concerning evil. What it say in 2 Corinthians 11, 3 about him corrupting the simplicity that's in Christ. And he wants to, you know, after you're saved, he can't get you unsaved, but he wants to take away any innocence that you have. You know, back before you had reached the age of having a knowledge of good and evil that you'd sinned against God, you were innocent. You hadn't reached the, what we call, age of accountability. But he loves it when he's taken away your innocence. He wants to take away all of our innocence, just like he did with Adam and Eve. But that's the first one, or the second one. The fir first one was when Lucifer was perfect. The second one was in the day that God created man. And then the third one is in the day they ate thereof. That's what I'm calling it. You may not like these titles, but I'm just giving it titles that go along with the narrative. That way people can't say, well, this is just man-made stuff. No, this is completely in the Bible. You go back to Genesis 3, 1 through 5. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So this is the day that they ate thereof. It says in Genesis 3, 5, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof. So that's what I titled this one. In the day they ate thereof. Eating from the tree caused them to lose their good standing with God. But you know what? Nothing that you do today can cause you to lose your good standing with God if you're saved. See, that's a completely different scenario going on there. Adam and Eve were right with God. They were in a good standing with God. They were perfectly innocent as... You know, they're full grown, perfectly innocent, and they would have stayed that way had they not ate off of a tree. Now, me and you, we got born again, we got saved, and nothing can take away that good standing with God. No matter what you do, no matter what sin you commit, nothing can take away your good standing with God. That's a completely different scenario there. And I had somebody one time use this as an illustration to me that, you know, Adam and Eve, and they called Adam and Eve saved. They said Adam and Eve were saved, but then they ate off the tree and they lost it and, and I had to get it back. So you see, that's wrongly dividing. They were safe by abstaining from something. And me and you aren't s s kept saved by abstaining from from something they were kept safe by abstaining from something but not me and you we're kept saved by the power of god now the spirit world also could be seen at this time think about it they saw the serpent in verse 8 they heard the voice of the lord god walking in the cool of the day after they had ate off the tree they could they could still hear the voice of the lord god walking in the cool of the day they could see the angel of the lord and in verse 24, they could see the cherubims that, that had a flaming sword keeping the way of the tree of life so they couldn't get back in there to eat it. That's completely different than what you have today because 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. Now, if I could go out and see cherubs, if I could go out and see the serpent, if I could go see the angel of the Lord, I'd be walking by sight and not by faith. 
they were walking by sight. Completely different scenario going on there. Uh, sin came into the world and ended the dispensation of innocence. That's what happened. When they got off of that tree, the, the devil had taken away their innocence in the day they ate thereof. And this starts the dispensation of conscience. You see, the day in the day they ate thereof, changes happened. Something began to happen that hadn't happened before. Things were different again. It ain't like it was in the day that God created man. It ain't like it was in the day that they were innocent. Things begin to change. So sin came into the world and ended the dispensation of innocence and starts the dispensation, or what man would call the dispensation of conscience. And you know what God had to do? God made coats of skins and clothed them. Genesis 3.21 He had to take an innocent animal, shed the blood of the animal, and clothe them with coats of skins. And that itself is different because before they were both naked and not ashamed. Now they're being clothed. Showing you it's not okay to be naked anymore. Showing you that now God is requir requiring this bloody animal sacrifice. So he's this is where he starts requiring blood sacrifices, which you're going to see with Cain and Abel. And to say, well, we need to do animal sacrifices because God himself killed an animal and made coats of skins and clothed them, that's, uh, that's wrongly dividing. Because you've already got the ultimate perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. So the Lord God makes coats of skins and clothed them in Genesis 3.21. Then you get over to Genesis 5.5, 5, or Genesis chapter 5, and you see all these ages of people. And they're living to be like 900 and something years old. And in Genesis 3.5, Adam lived 130 years and beget get a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years after he begat sons and daughters. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. So 930 years he lived. Now that's just strange um, to us because people don't live that long today. You see, there's even a difference in how long people live. So Adam dies. Death shows up. You got death showing up. You, got, you had death showing up with Cain and Abel after the fall. You know, if they had not ate off the tree, nobody ever would have died. And you've got, like I said, animal sacrifices that keep them in good standing. Like, just like I said with Cain and Abel, these animal sacrifices, they keep them in good standing. Genesis 4, 4 through 5. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth. And his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, why art, why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. So all he had to do was get a sacrifice from Abel and offer a lamb to God instead of the fruit of the ground. And then he would be accepted. That would keep him in good standing. Those bloody animal sacrifices would keep him in good standing. That's not true for today. Today you're only in good standing with God 
by getting the perfect sacrifice applied to you, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'm going to go ahead and stop with those three, and we'll keep going with this rightly division next time. But today we talked about when Lucifer was perfect. He was perfect, but he's not anymore. We talked about in the day that God created man. And this involved before man had sinned, back when they were innocent. So that's much different. And then you got in the day they ate thereof. And that brought in all the consequences of sin. That brought in all the um, bloody animal sacrifices. And opens up a whole new can of worms but you see you go through the Bible and just believing and reading what it says you're going to come up with extremely plain divisions extremely plain differences and if there's differences then you can't take the whole thing and apply it to you right now if you take the whole thing and apply it to you right now you're going to come up with contradictions. You're going to come up with you doing stuff that you ain't supposed to be doing. See, the Bible doesn't contradict. It's that you're trying to shove everything all on you at one time. And it, the Bible's not wrote that way. God didn't mean it that way. That's why he says you rightly divide the word of truth. You go through and you look at these dispensations dispensations not exactly a period of time dispensations is god dispensing truth and he dispenses out different truth in different periods of time and if you're going back and you're you're trying to shove the instructions that god gave to adam and eve in the day that god created man you're trying to shove those truths on yourself you're wrongly dividing at one time those were the truth of the day but it's not anymore but we'll, next time we'll pick up with the days of Noah.